Let's now begin this sixth and last session for this weekend Vipassana retreat based on these three marks of existence. In this last session, we'll begin with another meditation similar to the one we did in the last session, this meditation looking for this autonomous self. Following that, we'll give a little summary of some of the main points of the Vipassana practice of the three marks of existence that we've looked at this weekend. Then we'll look at the stages of progress that we go through in this Vipassana practice. We'll do another meditation on no self, um, a little bit different approach, a little bit more in line with the uh, method we're going to use in the next retreat in terms of coming to realize the emptiness of person. After that meditation, we'll look at how to set up the day, how to incorporate some of these Vipassana practices into our day. Time for question answer. And then a short preview of the upcoming uh, Vipassana retreat, just some of the main points we'll be covering. And then we'll finish with a, a dedication. And so let's begin with the meditation that we did last session that is we're going to again apply mindfulness cycling through first the body then the mind and then all phenomena and investigating is there a self to be seen anywhere and before we begin the meditation i'd like to read again a little bit about this practice from minding closely the book minding closely on page 128 and he says the following, when you pay very close attention to the body and mind, do you ever observe yourself? It is important to note that the Buddha never said there was no self at all. He actually said, I do not say there is no self. It is foolish to say that there is no self because we are all ourselves. When the Buddha was what the Buddha was addressing is our unrealistic notion of the self and our mistaken ways of apprehending it, for which I gave the example of thinking I'm Napoleon. Such thinking is obviously delusional. More commonly, I may conceive of myself as an inherently real entity that possesses a body and a mind. The notion that I stand apart from, observe and control my body and mind is quite unremarkable. I feel I really do exist. If you insult me, I will be unhappy. Uh, if you praise me, I will be thrilled. You are not judging my body or mind. It's me you're talking about. I'm the real target of praise or ridicule. I am not my body or my mind, even though I am closely tied to them and have meaningful control over them. My hand moves at my will, and I think what I choose to think. When we actually observe the body and mind, what appears is more like the froth on a boiling pot of soup. Nothing is stable. Everything emerges and disappears from moment to moment. The body is in a constant flux. Cells are dying and being reborn. Blood is circulating. The breath moves in and out. Similarly, nothing is stable in the mind. Mental events arise in staccato fashion, become a dynamic flow of thoughts and images tumbling over themselves in rapid succession. From physiological and mental perspectives, everything is in a constant flux. Nevertheless, as I grasp onto my reified self, I seem to change only at a glacial pace. I am not immutable and I'm not the same as I was the, at the age of five, but I'm still me. This is a description of the individual's actual lived sense of self. The experiential sen sense of I am does exist and it has real effects. If you praise or abuse me, I will feel happy or sad as a result of grasping onto my sense of self. But the question is this, does my sense of self correspond to anything, to something in reality? So investigate the body, feelings and mental states as they interact with the environment as a whole. 
can you perceive the self or find every, any evidence that such a self is actually present anywhere in this matrix of psychosomatic and environmental events? So that's what we're about to find out. So let's do that practice again. As always, we begin by preparing the body. Establishing that good, comfortable posture. Allowing the breathing to flow naturally and effortlessly. and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. Simply allowing it to come to rest in the present moment. Once again, we can begin our Vipassana practice by applying mindfulness to the body. That is investigating the field of the body on the basis of the question, is there a self to be seen anywhere in the field of the body? Look very closely.
And now apply mindfulness to the field of the mind. That is, observe the mind and any mental events arising in the mind. Thoughts, emotions, memories, mental images. And again, observe on the basis of the question, is there a self to be seen anywhere within that within the mind or within any of those mental events. And now apply mindfulness to all phenomena. That is, observe whatever is appearing to the mind, sensory or mental. And again, on the basis of the question, is there a self to be seen anywhere in any of those appearances?
And we can bring the meditation to a close. Let's begin with a short summary. So this is a Vipassana retreat. Um, Vipassana or in Pali Vipassana is usually translated as insight. And it's the practice of applying mindfulness to gain insight into nature of reality. And we saw there that this Vipassana practice is important because we need this insight into reality to overcome our distorted view of reality, which is the underlying cause of our mental afflictions and suffering. So if we want to be liberated from suffering, then we really need to uh, come to this insight into nature of reality. We had those four distorted views of reality. Um, the first three we have been looking at in this retreat and the last is a distorted view, that is to see things which are dependent as independent is the one we're mainly addressing in the next retreat, where we are looking at how to gain the insight into emptiness. So here in this retreat, we're focusing at the foundation level, these three marks of existence, of impermanence, suffering and no self. And in the impermanence, uh, Vipassana practice of impermanence, we're talking about gaining an insight into what's called subtle impermanence, the fact that things are changing moment by moment. Or if we really appreciate that well, to really realize that everything is a constant flow of change. And then the insight into suffering or dukkha, uh, we had those three levels of suffering or dukkha. The first one is obvious. Um, the second one, our pleasant experiences, to come to an insight there that pleasure, pleasure is, pleasant experiences are not in the nature of happiness. But at the deepest level, this insight into suffering is to come to this insight, this all-pervasive dukkha, that we are stuck in a condition where there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. And to, to realize that that's due to our mind being contaminated by the mental afflictions. And therefore, by coming to this insight into suffering, to then go on to develop this aspiration, this wish, or liber, wish for liberation from suffering. And then this no Vipassana practice of no self, meaning here, no autonomous person. So we saw there that actually, when we, if we use the word self just to mean person, then self exists because person exists. But here we're talking about overinflating our sense of self of person and grasping onto this autonomous me that really seems to be here. A me that seems to be something a little bit more than just the body and the mind. And so to realize there's no such autonomous self. What are the benefits of these three Vipassana practices that we looked at this weekend? Firstly, the Vipassana practice of impermanence, if we can really uh, gain that insight, we can really reduce dramatically our craving and attachment to pleasant things and thereby actually enjoy our pleasant experiences more. We'll find that we're more in harmony with the flow of life. We'll be using the flow of life to our advantage to move in better and better direction in our life. And also this is very much the basis for all the other insights of suffering, no self, and also emptiness. Also gaining an insight into suffering can, will help us to reduce attachment through understanding there's no genuine happiness to be found out there in those uh, objects that cause the pleasant experiences. And that at a deeper level that can help lead us to this wish to be liberated from suffering, often translated as renunciation. And also by gaining an insight into suffering, to see ourselves in that situation of dukkha, that can help lead us to cultivate compassion for others, understanding that everyone else is also in the same situation. And then the insight into no self will help us to reduce and eventually eliminate all our mental afflictions and thereby will lead us to liberation from suffering, to achieve that state of uh, Nirvana that we looked at earlier in this weekend. So let's now look at a couple of topics uh, for this session. Firstly, the stages of progress 
in this practice. So in the earlier shamatha retreat, we looked at that nine stage model in terms of stages of progress in shamatha. And so here we can look at stages of progress in a number of different ways. Firstly, we can talk about what's called the cultivating the three wisdoms. The wisdom arisen from hearing, from contemplation and meditation. Meaning that here first we need to hear some about these topics of impermanence, of suffering, no self and emptiness, um, to get some information about what these topics are and what the practices are. Then we need to reflect on these ideas that we heard or maybe even read in a book to contemplate them, to come to a correct intellectual understanding of impermanent suffering, no self and emptiness. But then simply gaining intellectual understanding of these um, topics is not going to really change our life at all. We need to bring that intellectual understanding into experience. And then we do that through meditation. And so similarly here, we have another presentation of the three stages of practice. Um, and here I like to use the Tibetan words, go, nyam, tok, because they're very short words. So go means intellectual. So the first stage is to gain an intellectual understanding of uh, the topic, be it uh, impermanence, suffering, no self or emptiness. And we do that through hearing and contemplating about topics to get a good intellectual understanding. But then we apply that intellectual understanding in practice, in meditation. And so then we meditate on these topics of impermanence, suffering, no self, to gain experiential insight, to gain some taste or experience, which is nyam. And depending on how focused our mind is, will depend on how much of a, how much we can penetrate uh, in meditation, meaning how strong a taste or an experience we can have of impermanence, suffering and no self. And so then if we can really gain these, in, start to gain these insights, these experiences of impermanence, suffering, no self, then we're going to start to see some temporary benefit, the ones we saw earlier, that as long as that experience is affecting our mind, then outside of meditation, we're going to notice some benefit. Uh, for example, if we have an experience of emptiness, uh, of, sorry, of impermanence in meditation, then uh, outside of meditation, while that's still affecting our mind, we're going to experientially see things a little bit more like in a flow state. And thereby we'll find that we'll have a little bit of a reduction in attachment. We'll enjoy things a little bit more. We won't be fighting against the flow as much as normal, but that experience will wear off quite quickly, maybe in a couple of minutes, uh, hours, days, or even maybe a bit longer, depending on how strong an experience we had in meditation. Um, so what we want to do is go to the next level is we want to stabilize those meditative experiences so they're stable and long lasting. And so the third stage is called realization or in Tibetan talk. So this is the wisdom of meditation. So to move from experience to realization, to stabilize those experiences, we need the support of shamatha. If we don't have that calm, clear, focused mind of shamatha, the best that we can hope for in Vipassana practice, in meditation, is some taste or experience, which could be quite uh, profound, uh, but the effects of that will be a little bit short-lived after the meditation and they'll wear off and we'll go back to the normal habits. So if we want that to be longer lasting, to have longer term benefit, then we really need to have this union of shamatha and vipassana, that our vipassana practice to be based on shamatha, then we can really fully penetrate the insights of impermanence, of suffering, of no self, to really have that stable long term realization and therefore those longer term benefits. And then in terms of actually following the, the spiritual path, here are these three marks of existence we're taking from the um, foundation level, the classic Theravada approach to Vipassana practice. And so in the Theravada Buddhist traditions, uh, in terms of stages of progress here in Vipassana, um, 
we have a very uh, classic model, this four results model. We go through these four stages of achieving these four results. And we do that through eliminating what's called the 10 fetters. Fetter means uh, the mental afflictions which bind us or hold us in samsara. And we see them listed down here at the bottom of the slide. And that the, the, at the first stage of progress in this model is when we come to this insight into no self. And so therefore we become what's called a stream enterer. And once we have this insight into no self, we eliminate the first three. We eliminate a belief in a self because now we've realized there's no self. We eliminate any doubt or uncertainty about the path because we've now come to see no self directly. And also we've eliminated any attachment to rites and rituals as, as a way of progressing on the path. We eliminate that quite easy. And then we, the next stage of progress is what's called once returner, where we continue to gain deeper and deeper insights and thereby start to really eliminate the mental afflictions. And one, the, uh, the result of once returner is where we've greatly reduced uh, sensual desire and ill will. We've really um, reduced them dramatically. We haven't fully got rid of them yet. Um, and then we become once returner. And then the next result of non-returner is when we have fully eliminated any sensual desire or ill will. But there's still some work to be done, some deeper level mental afflictions we need to eliminate to achieve the final result. And those are listed here, this craving for material existence, craving for material existence, conceit, another name for pride, restlessness or excitation, and then the most subtle levels of ignorance of nature of reality. And by eliminating all these 10 fetters or 10 mental afflictions fully, then we achieve the fourth result. That is, we achieve the goal of Nirvana, complete liberation from all suffering and its causes. And once we achieve that result, we're called what's called an Ahat. So this is the sort of the classic model of how we move along the spiritual path through Vipassana practice in Theravada traditions in, in terms of this insight into uh, no su uh, impermanence, suffering, and particularly the no self. In the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, and we'll look at this in more detail in the next retreat, then we have a slightly different model there in terms of stages of progress. We often have what's called the five paths model. And so here we've sort of tried to correlate these two models that in the Mahayana model, uh, we enter actually the path the first stage is called the path of accumulation when we've developed this renunciation. Remember, renunciation is the wish for liberation from suffering. So once we've um, developed or really cultivated that wish to be liberated from suffering, we enter the path to liberation. And that first stage is called the path of accumulation. And then we're doing this Vipassana practice and to really remember to came to a wisdom uh, uh, to a realization, particularly of no self, then we need that union of shamatha and Vipassana. So when we achieve that, we move to the next stage called the path of preparation. So even though we have that wisdom, we still haven't come to an actual direct realization of no self. When we do that, we move to the third stage called the path of seeing, seeing no self or realizing no self directly. And that is really correlated to this first result in the other model, the stream enterer, once we've come to that direct realization of no self. And then in the Mahayama model, over the next stage is called the path of meditation, where we are slowly over many stages within that uh, path of meditation, slowly eliminating all the mental afflictions, which then correlates with the uh, once returner and non returner uh, results in the previous model. And then the last stage here in the Mahayana model is when we achieve the final result, the result of Nirvana, when we achieve what's called the path of no more learning. We've completed the path. And this is uh, correlating to the result of an Arhat. So this is very briefly the, the two sort of classic models that we see in the Theravada and the Mahayana traditions. And this five paths model 
Um, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail in the next retreat because we're going to be looking at uh, the Mahayana, uh, the Pashana practice of emptiness, and then in terms of the stages of progress in emptiness practice, we're going to be using this five path model and we'll go into it in a little bit more detail than we've just done now. So that's um, some stages of the progress. And so now we'll go back to meditation. We'll go back to this a no self meditation. This time I'd like to use a slightly different approach, um, not using that approach of what's called the four applications of mindfulness, but we'll use an approach that is more in sync or uh, it's a more approach that used we find more used in the Mahayana tradition. So it's a, an approach very similar to the approach that we'll be using in terms of the emptiness practice in the next retreat. But here the same, the same goal as the earlier no self practice to come to an insight into there's no autonomous self. But a little bit of a different approach here. So see how we go. So let's do that practice now. Setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. Allowing the breathing to flow naturally and effortlessly. and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. Allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And simply becoming aware of the rhythm of your breath. Noticing if it's slow or fast, deep or shallow, long or short, without trying to modify it in any way. So simply focusing on the rhythm of the breath. Now, do you have a sense that there is a me here who is trying to relax the body and trying to focus the mind on the breath? 
a me that seems to exist from its own side and doesn't seem to depend upon anything else to exist. Do you have this experience? Where is this me who is trying to become the master or controller of this body and mind? Where is the me who is trying to relax the body? Is the body simply trying to relax itself? Or does there seem to be a me separate from the body who is trying to relax the body? If there seems to be a me separate from the body who's trying to relax the body, then where is this me? So investigate thoroughly and try to find the me who is relaxing the body. Don't try to intellectually answer this, just look. And where is the me who is trying to focus the mind on the breath? Is the mind simply trying to focus itself? Or does there seem to be a me separate from the mind who is trying to focus the mind? If there seems to be a me separate from the mind who's trying to focus the mind, then where is this me? And again, thoroughly investigate and try to find the me who is focusing the mind on the breath. Look very closely.
Now in your direct experience, what is actually here? There is the constant flow of physical change that is called the body. And there is the constant flow of mental experience that is called the mind. Just rest in that flow of body and mind. Yet other than the body and the mind, what else is there here? Look closely. If there's nothing more than the body and the mind here, then where is the me who is relaxing the body and focusing the mind? If you can't find that me, simply rest in the experience of not finding.
and we can bring the meditation to a close. One more topic before time for some question and answer. And that is setting up the day. How can we bring some of these uh, Vipassana practices into daily life? As I always recommend, uh, first thing when we wake up to set a good motivation for the day, the one I like every day, think as you wake up, I'm going to benefit others as much as I can from His Holiness Dalai Lama. And then in terms of morning meditation practice, what we've seen here is that if we really want to effectively engage in Vipassana practice, we really need some basis in shamatha practice. We need a, a more calm, clear, focused mind. So therefore, putting some emphasis into shamatha practice. And if you have some time in the morning to begin with some shamatha practice, and then to follow that up with a bit of Vipassana practice. And here we talked about these three marks of existence. What I'd recommend and what we saw was that impermanence is the starting point and it's really the foundation of the other two. And so with the impermanence, it can be very helpful to start in, at the beginning with the body, doing the body scan to really come to insight into impermanence with respect to the body. And then if we want, we can move to the mind, observing the mind to come to the insight into impermanence with respect to the mind. And then once we have a little bit of experience with impermanence, then we can very simply use that as a basis for looking for the self. To look for the self in that flow of the body and the mind, to come to this insight into no autonomous self. And then during the day, very helpful to uh, seed the day with some insight with Vipassana, and for this, we can use a number of approaches. One is to use some triggers, meaning that we can even set a timer to go off maybe once an hour or so, or another trigger can be whenever we get agitated or have a certain mental affliction. And then once that's triggered, then to do a little short Vipassana exercise, maybe just for 10 seconds or so. Just for example, notice when you have some, in, when the timer goes off or you have some agitation, just notice the flow of body and mind, notice the flow around us. And then also look for where is the self in this experience? And then during the day as well, whenever you notice any attachment arising, one very good antidote to that is impermanence. So again, if you find attachment arising for a thing or a person, then notice the flow of change that that personal thing is changing, you are changing, everything's changing. Um, and if you find that you have very strong grasping to me, um, then where is the self at that time? Um, so we can see the day with a little bit of that insight into impermanence and particularly no self to help reduce the mental afflictions and suffering and thereby also feed back into the meditation practices as well. So if we want any practice to be effective and progress, we need to do both of those things. Meditate to internalize, to bring knowledge into experience and then integrate into daily life. And we do those two things, they'll, they'll feed each other and we can progress most effectively. And then at the end of the day, if you have time at the end of the day to do a second meditation, then it's good to do a more active meditation, like a compassion practice or a, a Vipassana practice, um, maybe because we're a little bit tired at the end of the day, something a little bit more active. If we try and do shamatha practice end of the day, probably get very drowsy. And then to finish the day with a day review, how did our day go? Pick one good thing we did during the day, rejoice in that, be happy about that, and make a strong determination to continue that good behavior and then pick one negative thing we did during the day, sincere regret and look at ways and make a strong resolution not to, over, to, uh, not to do that negative behavior again. And then in, in terms of helping to uh, increase gratitude is to think of one thing we received during the day and then develop to be grateful for that, for having received that thing. So that's a few little things we can do to start to add a little bit of Vipassana into our daily life. 
and we'll continue and look at that a little bit more detail at the end of the uh, next retreat as well. So now we have a, bit, a little bit of time for question and answer. Um, so if you have any questions about anything from this weekend, uh, this weekend's retreat, then now is the time to ask. Last opportunity. Hi, Glenn. I have one short question. Sure. Um, I recently, well, last year actually, I attended the, we have a class here in Denmark with uh, Rob Priest about Buddhist Tantra. Yeah. And in his new book, he talks about, from last year, he talks about um, that he thinks renunciation is a mistranslation in the sense that he kind of, I think what he, he translates it into def, uh, definite arising instead. Definite emergence, yeah. A definite emergence, yes. Could you yeah. say a little about yeah. that? Exactly. That's, I mean, that's what I said earlier, is that I said that uh, renunciation is a bad translation, that the original term is ni sarana, which mm -hmm. means, uh, it's a Sanskrit term, it means uh, the, to, to the wish to be moved out of, away from suffering, to be liberated. Um, and what Rob Priest, I think, is taking the Tibetan word is ne chung. Exactly. Nair means definite and chung means to emerge. So the mind of definite emergence. So whether you do Sanskrit or, or the uh, Tibetan, the, the, the literal meaning is the, is the wish to be liberated, to emerge from suffering, to be liberated from suffering. Whereas I think someone maybe 50, 60 years ago or so decided on this word renunciation and it sort of stuck. <laughs> so it's very widely used. Um, and so because it's widely used and it's often completely misunderstood, um, then I, or I present it because it's, it's used so widely. But then I, like you said, I suggest that, you know, I say that like Rob Priest, that this is not a very good translation, in fact, and that it's uh, whenever you see the word renunciation, it really means the, the mind that aspires to be liberated from suffering. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, then let, maybe we can just do have a look at um, a short preview of what's upcoming in the fifth and last retreat, another Vipassana retreat, this time on emptiness. And so for this weekend retreat, we'll go back to the earlier format. We're going to, we'll have um, two days of four sessions each day and we'll have a, a lunch break of one hour. So the same program, the same schedule as the earlier retreats. And in this uh, retreat, we'll be looking at this view of emptiness and the sort of flip side of emptiness is the idea of dependent arising. And then we'll be looking at this chart, this Baba Chakra, this wheel of life chart that we see here, we, which we briefly touched on in this retreat. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail, particularly these, what's called the 12 links of dependent arising, these 12 diagrams around the outside. Uh, which really describe how we are stuck in this situation or the state of dukkha life after life. And together with that, we'll be looking at how our distorted view of reality, the process of how our distorted view of reality leads to the mental afflictions, leads to the state of dukkha that we find ourselves in. And then in terms of practice, uh, emptiness practice, we'll be focusing on two core emptiness practices. One is uh, focusing on the emptiness of person and the other one is what's called nature of mind practice. So they're the two main emphasis in terms of emptiness practice. And in terms of stages of progress, we'll, we'll unpack that five stage model, the five path model we briefly touched on earlier in this session. And so for this retreat, we're going to have a number of charts. We'll have this colored diagram, well, this diagram here, this Baba Chakra diagram, but I'll, I've got a black and white one with some descriptions of all the various parts. Um, we've got a suffering and its causes chart, and we've also got this Mahayana path, path chart, which lays out the stages of progress. So um, make sure that uh, Martina will uh, send those out 
um, to you in the coming days. So you'll have those available for that retreat. And then the recommended reading for that retreat uh, is How to See Yourself as You Really Are. So that's the book I tend to recommend uh, for if we're, when we're starting the emptiness practice. It talks a lot of uh, very, in a very easy way about emptiness, ignorance, dependent arising, and also some meditation exercises in that book. So that's the, the recommended reading for uh, this particular retreat upcoming in three weeks time. So that's a short re re preview of the upcoming retreat. Um, so then just to finish this weekend retreat, let's dedicate again, let's dedicate all our efforts from this weekend's retreat based on, again, this very famous dedication prayer from the great Indian master, Shanti Deva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you. So next retreat, three weeks time, October 3rd, 4th, Vipassana retreat on emptiness is the topic. So hope to see you all then. Uh, until then, stay safe, stay well. See you in three weeks time. So bye now.